chapter 36. Combinational logic circuits. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to describe the functions of encoders, decoders, multiplexers, adders, subtractors, comparators, secret decoder rings. I added that one. We're not going to talk about secret decoder rings. Okay. Should. Identify the schematic symbols for encoders, decoders, multiplexers, adders, subtractors, comparators, secret decoder rings. Just kidding, we're not really going to do that. Identify applications for combina combinational logic circuits, and then finally develop truth tables for different combinational logic circuits. First type of circuit we're going to talk about is what's called an encoder. An encoder is a combinational logic circuit that accepts one or more inputs and generate a multi-bit binary output. A decimal to binary encoder takes a single digit as input and produces a 4-bit output. A decimal to binary priority encoder accepts the same higher order key when two are pressed at the same time. An example of this is a keypad on a security alarm, right, or any time you got a keypad. Basically when you depress a number, you depress the number five, it's going to produce a one, zero, one output. It's going to take that one button that you're hitting as a human interface and then it's going to convert that immediately and encode that into really a machine language, the machine's language, the language of ones and zeros that it understands. Make sense? Keyboard is the same thing. When you hit a key on the keyboard, it typically is going to encode it into an ASCII format that really takes up seven bits. We use eight bits. Uh, because there's actually a, 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 a parity check, if you will, and then that feeds it into the computer. So by you hitting any key on the keyboard, it's a certain combination using a minimum of seven bits that gets communicated into the computer. You're encoding. Sounds really complex. It's really not. It's really fundamental. You hit a button on a keypad, it gets converted into a binary number. You're encoding. Obviously, if you encode something, you also have to be able to decode it. One of the most frequently used combinational logic circuits is the decoder. The pro uh, basically, a process a complex binary code into a recognizable digit or character. If any of you, have any of you ever like stared at a digital clock, suffered from insomnia and like stared at that digital clock and see the number increment? Um, basically, what's driving that digit? What's making that number, those segments on a digital clock light up, is a decoder and a driver. You're feeding that specific digit a binary code, it's converting it into a character that we recognize as a base 10 number. I actually see in these science catalogs, they have these binary clocks that you could order, binary digital clocks. You can actually make one. We had students made one here as a project, summer project, a couple of years back. It was a digital clock that the readout was in binary. So if you suffer from insomnia, you're not going to be staring at that clock for long. <laughs> what time is it? Let's see, it's 3.42 a.m. So that's what a decoder does, takes a binary digit and then converts it back into another form that's useful for us. Multiplexers have been around for a while, and these are pretty cool circuits. They're circuits that are used to select and route any one of several input signals to a single output. An example would be a multi-position switch. Um, let's say, for example, that Daniel in the back of the room, he's got, I've got, a, I've got one of them, they're multiplexers, and he's got one of them, they're demultiplexers on the other end. But let's keep a simple, let's say that we only can afford enough wire for me to go to Daniel one piece of wire. But I've got five different pieces of data that I want to ship to him. So Daniel, can you put your switch in my switch's position? Okay. Everybody see, look, walk, look back at Daniel, okay. Now watch. Now I'm going to go here.
We could be shipping five different pieces of data over one piece of wire as long as I put the switch to position A, he puts it to position A. I move it to B, he moves it to position B. So obviously, with digital multiplexing, there's a way of doing that like really, really rapidly. So you're using only a couple pieces of copper wire and you're communicating tons of data. And you really minimize the complexity of the interconnections between different pieces of equipment. Um, a lot of my equipment in the military used multiplexing and demultiplexing. So it just really cut down the amount of wire between connecting two boxes together, if you will. So does that make sense to you? So it could be digital or analog data, it really doesn't matter. Let's talk about arithmetic circuits. The first arithmetic circuit we're going to talk about is the adder. The adder. It's the primary computation unit in a digital computer. As a matter of fact, most complex problem solved by computers is nothing more than repetitive addition. It's designed to work in either serial or parallel circuits. The half adder circuits do not take into account any carries. You know what I mean by a carry? When you're adding two numbers, right? If I add the number 9 plus 9, what's 9 plus 9? 9 plus 9 is actually 8, carry the 1, which gives us the answer of, you were correct in the back, 18. But it's really 9 plus 9 is 8, carry the 1. Make sense? So a half adder doesn't take into account the carry. So basically, if it's your most significant digit, where would you carry the number 2? Or where would you, I'm sorry, the least significant digit, I said that wrong. If you're the least significant digit, what would you be carrying from? Where would you get that carry from? 9 plus 9 is 18. There's nothing smaller than units, unless there were tenths of units. If there were tenths of units, then that, the even whatever the minimum number is, you're not going to be carrying from some, some place. There's no place to carry from. You're the least significant digit. So that's what a half adder is. Let's take a look. The full adder takes the carry into account. It's going to have three inputs and generates a sum and a carry output. The three inputs are going to be the number you want to add to the number you want to add and that carry from the preceding digit. And it's going to generate the carry out. Half subtractors do not have a borrow input. Again, where can you be borrowing from if you're the most significant digit in a number? It's going to have two inputs and generate a borrow output. You're always going to generate that borrow. Full subtractors have three inputs and generate a difference and a borrow output. The difference is going to be what the, two, the difference of the two numbers is and a borrow if you've got to do that borrow. Simple subtraction. Comparators are cool circuits. Comparators are used to compare the magnitudes of two binary numbers can indicate whether one binary number is larger than the other. But the big thing that comparators are used for is the magnitudes. If you've set your digital alarm clock, you're basically setting a comparator circuit. When this value equals this value, set this bit, and that's going to turn on your clock radio or start playing your CD or do whatever it is that your alarm clock does. A comparator is basically the circuit that you see in Hollywood with the countdown of the bomb going off. The only difference is if you've got somebody that's sophisticated enough of making a timing device, why would they put like a digital readout on it and make like the people you're trying to blow up know when the bomb is going to go off? <laughs> Probably the best example. Do you ever notice that? I mean, why would you do that? I wouldn't do it. 
I'd like build a digital display and then I'd do it like modular, I'd like set it and then I'd unplug it and then I'd keep the display with me. <laughs> my pop's gonna go off. I don't want it to take my freaking beautiful LED display with it. <laughs> Probably the best show that I saw that was pretty accurate, I thought, kinda in an odd way. Um, any of you, did you ever watch 24 when it was on TV? Jack Bauer, protecting, uh, protecting humanity from bad guys, bad guys. One of the uh, episodes, I think it was season two or something, there was a nuclear bomb in Los Angeles. A lot of bad stuff happened in Los Angeles. I don't know why the, the film uh, office of Southern California would approve them doing shows like that. I mean, how could it help tourism? Nuclear bombs on the, you know, missing. It's like Hawaii Five-0. Any of you watch the new Hawaii Five-0? Great scenery, but it's kind of like, man, there's bad stuff happening in Hawaii. I don't know if I want to go there. <laughs> but anyway... They basically had a nuclear bomb that was set to go off, and it didn't have a digital readout on it. So basically what the technician had to do is get in there and look at the value that was set in the register and then compare that and say, we've got 43 minutes before this thing goes off. But it wasn't the countdown, the four, three, two, one. So basically they had to get in and look at what the bits were set, and that was pretty accurate because... Well, it was accurate for that type of a device. It wasn't accurate for a nuclear weapon. That's for another, another classified lecture that we won't be conducting here. <laughs> so most of the triggering devices on nuclear weapons are more mechanical than they are electronic. And they cannot be defeated. Electronics, it's always work around. Mechanical, everything has to be just so. If it's not, it ain't going to work. Now, PLDs, Programmable Logic Devices. There's four, three forms of PLDs. There's a programmable read-only memory called the PROM. How many of you here went to the PROM? Went to the PROM? Was it good? Was it? It's a female perspective. <laughs> I never thought it was uh, financially prudent for me to go to the prom. It was like a tremendous amount of money and a certain amount of uncertainty with the whole event. So, um, yeah, I was never a big prom guy. I think find it hard to believe, but it's the truth be told. I figured I'd take her out for one of those uh, cheeseburgers and see how things were looking and kind of take the situation from there. <laughs> never went to the prom. Anyway, that's not the kind of prom we're talking about kind of prom we're talking about is the programmable read-only memory, the first of three different PLDs. The second type is called a programmable array logic, PAL, and then we've got a programmable logic array, PLA. Now these PROMs are used primarily as storage devices, and what they store is firmware. Firmware. The program that tells a device you are a digital camera. Here's your input-output devices. Here's your basic settings. Your camera. Tells a computer, you are a computer. You need to go and boot up. You've got floppy drives. You've got hard drives. You've got the ability to communicate. You've got a real-time clock. You've got all these things. You are a computer. That's typically the program that a, a prom will carry. Now, PALs can be programmed to solve a variety of complex logic equations. Remember what we did last week in the Boolean expression, in the simplified Boolean expression? If you have that simplified Boolean expression, you could program a PAL to give you the certain outputs that you want when certain conditions are met. When the Boolean criteria is met, you'll get those outputs. So for an engineer trying to, you know, design something like on an airplane, you know, if the airspeed is over this, if the flaps are up, then you enable this, that allows them to increase the throttle setting or do whatever. You know, it's a specific set of logic criteria that needs to be met for something to happen. And then the PLA is similar to the PALs, but they're more flexible due to the additional level of logic gates. So PALs have, um, there's more you could do with them. And the way that these things actually work, these gates are all integrated into the array. And when you write the program, if you will, the Boolean expression to this, and it's actually called burning. And literally what you're doing is burning these little fusible links 
that are inside the arrays. And if once you burn that, then you no longer could communicate on that line, and then you get a specific logical outcome. That's why uh, even burning proms, I mean, it's very common for a technician. What'd you do this afternoon? Oh, I was burning proms. And that's physically what you're, you're doing, is, is you're, you're burning these fusible links and you're writing a program permanently to that prom. Make sense? In summary, an encoder accepts one or more inputs and generates a multi-bit binary output. A decimal to binary encoder takes a single digit, 0 through 9, and produces a 4-bit output code that represents the digit. A priority encoder accepts the higher order key when two keys are pressed simultaneously. A decimal to binary encoder is used for, useful for keyboard encoding. So when you hit a key on a keyboard, automatically you hold that button down, pow, it's sending that digital, that binary coding into the computer. A decoder processes a complex binary code into a digit or character that is easy to recognize. A BCD to seven segment decoder is a special purpose decoder to drive seven segment displays. And that's what I was talking about with the digital clock. You give it that binary input, automatically knows exactly what segments to light up and encode it to so that when you, know, you put in the number one, you get the number one. You put in the number seven, you get the number seven. You put in the number eight, all your segments light up, you get the number eight. Multiplexes allow digital data from several sources to be routed through a common line for transmission to a common destination. Can handle both analog and digital data. Can be hooked up, both parallel and serial. The truth table for adding rules of binary numbers is equivalent to the truth table of an AND gate and an exclusive OR gate. This is clearly illustrated in your text. It's the same circuit, basic adder. Half adder takes the carry into account. No, that's not right. Half adder does not take the carry into account. It's a typo. To add two four bit numbers requires three full adders and one half adder. Half adder because, again, you don't have anything to, to carry to. The truth table for subtracting rules of the binary numbers is equivalent to the truth table for an AND gate and an inverter on one of the inputs and an exclusive OR gate. A half subtractor does not have a borrow input. A full subtractor has a borrow input. A comparator is used to compare the magnitudes of two binary numbers and it could be used as a triggering device on an explosive. Generates an output only when the two bits being compared are the same. So it's really great to be able to program it as a countdown so when these numbers are equal, count down or count up, when they're equal, it'll go off. Can also determine whether one number is larger or smaller than the other. Use it as a comparator. Any questions on anything that we covered in Chapter 36?